Well, uh, welcome to our special event tonight. I really am delighted to see all of you. I am uh, Don Carlton, and I'm the executive director of the Doc Briscoe Center for American History. Uh, this is really a special evening for us, and I think, do we have the, this, both mics on now? Okay. Um, at any rate, again, welcome uh, to our event, and uh, we're here to recognize and also to thank award-winning filmmaker Paul Steckler, who I know is a good friend of several people in here. Uh, and we're thanking him for his generous gift of his professional archive as a filmmaker uh, to the Briscoe Center. Now, over the last 30 years, uh, Paul's films uh, have appeared frequently uh, on public television. But I want to stress that Paul's archive is not just simply a box set of PBS programs. This is actually the stuff that gets put together when one is making a documentary film, and it's very valuable for historical research. His archive includes hours and hours of this raw footage, and it represents a unique visual documentation of America's political landscape, really, over the last 30 years. In other words, this archive will be a rich teaching tool, and students and researchers will gain insight both into how documentary films are made uh, and also how politics works in this country. I want to take this moment, in fact, to please you know, join me in thanking Paul for donating this collection. Paul, where did you go? There you are. No, not yet, not yet. I've known Paul personally, uh, I, I can't believe it now, it's 18 years since he came on the campus. It uh, seems like yesterday, Paul, I can't believe it. But I knew his work before I knew him. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard University, and he worked as a political pollster in Louisiana before he became a documentary filmmaker. And let me tell you, folks, if you think uh, Texas politics is strange, visit Louisiana. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time in New Orleans uh, for, for family reasons, and uh, I've been uh, also very interested in uh, Louisiana politics and the weirdness of it all. We're going to see a little glimpse of it tonight, in fact. At any rate, uh, Paul combines film projects with being a first class, really a master teacher in the department of uh, radio, television, and film. He's, in fact, he's the chair of that department here on campus. And he's also a professor uh, here at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. And in short, he has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to understanding our political culture and all of its quirks, contradictions, and curiosity. And it, I guess it just keeps getting weirder and weirder as we go along, Paul. Tonight, Paul is going to share some of his favorite moments uh, from his documentaries. And for those of you here tonight who are Paul's peers in the film world, I, I encourage you to please consider the Dop Briscoe Center uh, for a place to put your archival materials where they can be preserved and in the service of educating others uh, for many, many years to come. The Briscoe Centers, uh, well, really, the Briscoe Center is one of the nation's premier history research centers. Our manuscript and documents collections alone measure nearly 90,000 linear feet. Now, that's about 16 miles of boxes if we aligned them all up end to end. Now, however, that's not all. The center also is home to more than six million photographs, 57,000 sound recordings, and 17,500 video recordings. Now, these collections, of course, are open for research, for your research. That's the reason we have them. Uh, anyone can come and use our, our collections. Uh, and just in the last year, We've had production companies working on films at the Briscoe Center uh, for PBS, the History Channel, Al Jazeera, uh, and BBC. Um, and many of them have licensed uh, images or recordings from our collections for their productions. We also make use of the center's collections for our own projects, which include books, conferences, 
events like tonight, documentary films. Indeed, in 2013, the, the Austin Film Society, uh, one of our co-sponsors this evening, uh, selected our award-winning film, When I Rise, uh, which was directed by Matt Hames, uh, for the Texas Independent Film Network's spring program. Uh, which was a great experience for us, and we appreciated uh, the Austin Film Society's involvement and in, in support in that. Now, Paul Steckler's focus on American politics was one of the reasons that the center is such a good fit for your archive. Uh, the Briscoe Center has uh, one of the nation's largest and most valuable collections documenting American political history. Our holdings include the papers of more than 50 former and present members of Congress. Uh, also 10 governors, and 11 Texas House speakers. Among those are the papers of former Congressman, UN, uh, UN Ambassador, Secretary of Energy, and Governor of New Mexico, Bill Richardson. Governor Richardson is with us tonight. Please stand and be recognized, Governor. Now, Governor Richardson is also one of the newest members of the Briscoe Center's uh, Advisory Council, uh, which has its biannual meeting here in this building in the morning. Uh, this council means everything in the world to the Briscoe Center, and the people who serve on it are extremely important to us. And so I'd like the members of our council who are with us tonight to stand and please be recognized. Please, let's, please stand. We couldn't do it without you guys, I promise. And finally, I want to thank again the, the Austin Film Society and KLRU uh, who are co-sponsoring this uh, event tonight with us. Uh, Paul is a member of the Austin Film Society's board, and, and, and KLRU has been really the way most of us have seen your films over the years uh, is through KLRU. Uh, so we're all indebted to your service as, as to those organizations as well as your body of work, Paul. So please welcome Paul Steckler as he joins me up here. Uh, Paul, I think you've got some words that you want to speak. Well, I wanted to thank the Briscoe Center and Don. I wanted to thank Keller U and my friend Bill Stotesbury and the Austin Film Society and Rebecca Campbell and Charlie Napis, uh, the best film society in the United States. Um, you know, when, uh, when I talked to Don about uh, putting the archive here, uh, that meant that I had to actually look at all this stuff and put it into boxes. And it was really interesting looking at a lot of the old footage, you know, and just the, some of the things I found. I found Ann Richards' note to me uh, talking about how much she liked my fabulous film, Spit Farther, the greatest film ever made about watermelon seed spitting, <laughs> which you can see on Caroline Frick's Texas Archive with a movie and image. I believe it's the most watched film in that entire archive. Isn't that the case? <laughs> By me, yes. Uh, I've got Lyle Lovett's audition tape for the George Wallace film. I've got uh, my correspondence with Jerry Springer when I was thinking about doing a film about Jerry running for governor of Ohio. Uh, I've got letters to Molly Ivins. Um, I actually have Rick Perry's police tape when he was stopped by the state police I, in 2000. A memorable moment. I sent the getting down the road statement. So there's a lot of interesting stuff in it. Um, I saw Paul Begala this morning. Uh, he was talking over at the Austin Club, and I've known Paul, uh, I think, almost 20 years. I think we met on a TV show where they were showing them. I don't know how many people have seen the famous Rodney Ellis on the floor of the state senate sequence from Vote for Me, which got me an award. Uh, from the House of Representatives and censured by the State Senate. <laughs> um, but um, I realized just how long it's, it's been I've been doing this because I knew I've known Paul for 20 years and we always talk about the films I've done. You know, but I'd already been making films for almost two decades by when I met him here in Texas. Um, I've had a really, really lucky career in that um, I passed a book uh, today on the way over here um, in, in my house, War Justs. Uh, a series of short stories about uh, Washington, D.C., and it's called uh, The Congressman Who Loved Flaubert. And if I ever wrote about my own career, it would be the filmmaker who loved politics. Yeah. Uh, or basically the guy who loved politics who became a filmmaker. Yeah. Um, I did politics beforehand. Uh, <coughs> Governor uh, Richardson, uh, you knew uh, Will William Jefferson, uh, whose campaign for mayor I ran. Uh, he's in the federal penitentiary now for... <laughs> 
having $100,000 marked bills in his freezer, and he still owes me $30,000, <laughs> which I don't think I'm going to get. Um, but I always thought that, um, you know, like a, how a minor league catcher is a really good manager, uh -huh. you know, but not a really good catcher. Uh, well, I wasn't a really good consultant, but I was a better filmmaker in politics. But I've been really lucky. I've been able to make every film I've ever wanted to make. Um, you know, uh, when I got my PhD, you know, all my graduate uh, peers turned their dissertations into books, and I turned mine on black politics in the Mississippi Delta into a film. But I've been able to make films about New Orleans politics, George Wallace. I did two, uh, two of the Eyes on the Prize films with a uh, woman, Jackie Shearer, since passed away. Uh, I made a film about Battle of Little Bighorn with uh, the fabulous late novelist James Welch, Native American novelist. George Wallace film I worked on with the historian Dan Carter. Uh, Dan O'Dan. Uh, yeah. Battle of Little Bighorn. I worked uh, with uh, uh, the star of American Studies, Richard Slotkin, and just just all these amazing people. You know, plus I've been able to work with so many you know, fabulous filmmakers here in Austin, Texas. Deb Lewis is over there, my cinematographer. Matt uh, McClung in back of there worked on two films with me. Sandra Gordado, who edited When I Rise, uh, you know, has edited yeah, with me right. for over yeah. a decade. Yeah. So uh, this has been an amazing place to be. And, um, you know, in some ways, you know, coming here was a real blessing because I was able to make films, but at the same time, I got the best job you could possibly get, which is working at the University of Texas and helping to remake the radio television film department which is now the best film department that you can actually afford to go to in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the folks that I did it with, Richard Lewis, you know, Andrew Shea, uh, I see Cindy McCurry over there, you know, Tom Schatz, who helped me write the five-year plan years ago, Charles Ramirez Berg, uh, you know, just our, you know, we're, we're part of that process. So what I did for tonight uh, was I put together a short clip reel of 30 years of film. It's only 23 minutes, but it's got a little bit of every single film that I helped work on. So why don't we take a look at that, yeah. and uh, then we'll talk about it. That great. Let's put it on. Let's... I love politics. I certainly do. I think it's an enjoyment. Everybody should participate in it. Let my stay home and twiddle their thumbs, and then they complain the following day. That's too late after the election. You gotta go out and vote for the man that you want to get in there. Oh, beautiful, far heroes proved in liberating strife. Hi, I'm Milton Johnson Jr., and I'm running for Alderman of the 24th Ward, the city of Chicago. Hi, I'm David Rambo. I'm running for District Attorney, District 21 in Oklahoma. Hi, I'm Donna Peterson. I'm running for Congress in the Eastern District of Texas, Texas 2. I'm Larson Medicine Horse, and I'm running for Sheriff of Bighorn County here in Montana. Success. I am John David Franz, and I am running for re-election as mayor of the Killer Bee capital of the United States, Hidalgo, Texas. Ever again divine. And you know when I was in school, we used to sing it something like this. Listen here. Now, a lot of politicians, I think they're kind of quirky. They've they got a kind of a defect. It's a defect that can only be satisfied by mass affirmation. They, you know, like Sally Fields at the Academy Awards, they like me. They really like me. They have to be articulate. They have to be good at, at uh, uh, speaking and have a good personality, I think. And, uh, because of television. But that's what you're going yep, to. That's what you're going to hear. That's what you're going but to hear. But they got to be believable too. If, as a politician, you have a need to be loved universally, I would guess that you don't have a sufficient amount of resources to afford the therapy that it's going to take to keep you sane. You'd better. Be prepared to know that on any given day, it may very well be a majority of the people who think you are really a dipshit. 
Okay, we'll see you on election day. Okay. Mississippi, whether because of itself or in spite of itself, is in the midst of transforming the kind of politics which it had practiced certainly prior to the 1965 Voting Rights Act. It was very difficult to organize because at the time that we came in here, you still had a kind of pervasive uh, terror in this state, and there was a great deal of fear. Go left. There was a great deal of fear. And so getting people to come out here and walk up there to that courthouse and to talk to that circuit clerk uh, about registering to vote was one hell of a thing. I mean, that was one giant step. That was walking from one century to the next century you know, in terms of going to that courthouse. We're going to walk through the, the, the desired area. As we walk down, we're going to knock on doors. We're going to request people to come out and vote for Bill Jefferson, our candidate. The mayor-elect is with us. We want to be enthusiastic, we want to be polite, and we want to make sure we knock on everybody's door. You been out yet, bro? Uh -huh. All right, how you doing? All right, brother. I'm going to the All right, man. I'm not missing now here. Okay. We need you, brother. Eight years ago, they were saying, just give us a black man. I don't care if he never do anything. The white man has never done anything for us. So if he get in there, just, just to say he's in there is good enough for us. Now you're seeing them trying to wait. The, the, the issues and who's gonna be the best black mayor, not just give us any black mayor. The black people not only gonna want somebody of their color representing them, but they gonna want somebody of their thought. King hoped to avoid speaking at that night's rally and to rest instead at the Lorraine Motel. There was a tornado warning in Memphis that evening. And it was raining, raining, and wind was blowing everywhere. I believe a little tornado came uh, to Memphis also. And he knew that there would not be a big crowd. And he said to me in the meeting with the staff, uh, Ralph, I want you to go and speak this evening at the mass meeting. And he didn't want to go to that meeting that night. Uh, he said uh, he had sent Reverend Abernathy over, and he said, because uh, I just didn't feel like going, but uh, it's thundering and lightning here. We have a thunderstorm taking place. He said, but you know, Ralph has just called and said that I needed to come over. And said the people were waiting for me, and they really didn't want to anybody else to speak but me. So he said, I guess I'll go on over there. And I'll call you later. He said, I'll call you tomorrow night. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country. Maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly, somewhere I read of the freedom of speech, somewhere I read, of the freedom of press, somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. And so just as I say we aren't going to let any dogs or water hoses turn us around, we aren't going to let any in 
injunction turn us around? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. A third of Reno's men were now killed, wounded, or missing. Downriver, Custer was unaware of Reno's route. <laughs> one of the scouts, White Swan, and also another one by the name of Gozahead, took off their civilian clothes, started putting on their Indian <clears throat> battle dress and all. And they were singing their medicine songs or war songs or sometimes called death songs. The scouts told Custer they would all die that day. My grandfather was one of Custer's scouts and he taught me his war song. Ignoring their warnings, Custer discharged his Indian scouts, but he needed more men to attack. He scrawled an order for reinforcements and sent it back to Benteen. The people out here have all heard the stories of his womanizing, of his gambling, of corruption. Why do they love Evan Edwards? This guy looked at me and said, he doesn't drink or smoke. <laughs> but I really was impressed with the skit that the five representatives of the women members of the legislature did. And this emphasis on women, this new thrust that we, I mean, this new, um, <laughs> We have we, this new commitment we have to the involvement of women in the political process. Uh, certainly, they said it very well. The motto from here on out is up with skirts and down with paints. <laughs> Many times you'll explain things to people who've just moved into the area, and you see this sudden look of bewilderment or disbelief as if to say, You mean your elected officials can get away with saying something like that? And you say, Well, sure. And then you have to remind yourself, oh, that's right, they're not from Louisiana. The one thing about Edward, he's never lied about it. You know, if he goes to Las Vegas, he goes. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with a little color. Saying it took one opponent an hour and a half to watch 60 Minutes, Edwards boasted that he couldn't lose unless he was found in bed with a dead girl or a live boy. And he was right. Populist in style, a powerful stump speaker, yet at ease with modern television campaigning, Edwards set the tone for politicians throughout the state. Who was the greatest politician you've seen in Louisiana during your lifetime? My lifetime, it would have to be every time I shave and look in the mirror, I see him. Start your tour of American politics, not in Washington, but in a place like Norman, Oklahoma, where the only thing bigger than politics is football, and where it helps to have a guide who knows both games equally well, someone like Democratic Party leader Mike Turpin. Politics is show business for ugly people. I mean, that's why a lot of people get into this thing. It's just all about ego. The difference between a horse race and a political race, in a horse race, the whole horse runs. <laughs> the political true. race, just, just you know, anyway, yeah, 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 whatever. All right. Yeah, I'm one of those. How's it going? The future, the future first lady of the state of Oklahoma, right here, Janice Mildred. You guys got up early. You gonna win? Yeah, I'm gonna win. The next congressman, right here, folks. Good to meet you. Jack Mildred. Hey, Mike. How come they're following you around? The next governor of the state of Oklahoma, Jack Mildred. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did you run for governor one? One time. Yeah. How do you How do you feel about it? Oh, it's gonna be close race. Looks like. Aren't you glad you ran and got it out of your system? Yes, sir. <laughs> no matter how jaded some Americans may get about their politics, 
there will always be people like Mike Turpin. Young Democrat, thank you. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Good job, you know. They are the folks for whom politics is the only game for grown-ups. Happy warriors who know that come what may, there will always be another election in a couple of years. Any great politician's got the good mental Rolodex. I mean, he can flip through it that quick to know who he is, who she is, where are they from, what city, what county, and hopefully what their job is, and maybe even how many kids they got. And if you're real good, you say, by the way, wasn't yesterday your birthday? The very first time that Maggie sang on the campaign trail, I, I think it was the first week I was with her, and we were out in Cherokee County in this school gym. She was really tired, and when she gets tired, she, she, I think she in her mind she said, i got to get out of this, I'm not doing well. So she picked up this dulcimer, it's a bluegrass stage, and started singing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You know, I thought, you know, oh God, no. you know I, I was thinking, please, you know, you're running for Congress. Um, we're going down the tubes already, it's week one, here she's singing folk songs. You know, I thought, please get me out of this. And she sang Amazing Grace. And this boy turned to me and said, that's why she's going to win, brother, because Jesus Christ died for your sins. And I said, yes. <laughs> We're going to Washington. Every day that goes by, I think more and more, Maggie just needs to sing Amazing Grace. Not because it, it, it manipulates people, because, but because it, it relates to people, it touches people. I mean, who, who sings Amazing Grace in politics? Everybody seems to be here, everybody white. The city auditorium is packed with sweating, jostling bodies. Two little blonde-haired boys try hard not to get stepped on as their mama, holding tight to their hands, steers them through the cheering crowd. A band is playing Dixie as the people clap their hands in time. And someone is waving a Confederate battle flag back and forth, back and forth. Sam and I stand together, understanding only a little of what is being said. The governor talks about a lot of things, but mostly he seems to be telling us that we are better than the Negroes. We had not known that we were better than anybody. Here's a man of great talents, great skill, great charm, great everything, but it was all focused in the wrong direction, in the pursuit of power for the wrong reasons. That's the great tragedy of George Wallace. Why, in the name of common sense, can you be too strong about segregation? Gee, the fight or you against it. They're not in the middle ground that I know of. George Wallace caused a lot of suffering and a lot of misery, and I believe a lot of deaths. I don't think the governor owes anyone an apology. How do you blame Governor Wallace who stands with his traditions and customs and state and defies an entire national establishment. Maybe you can say the cause was wrong, but I think the, uh, the man in many ways was right. Hi, Rick Green, I'd appreciate your support. Vote green like money, don't forget. Run against the guy in a green Steve. shirt, he's a Republican. It's real crooked, son of a bitch. Rick Green, I'd sure appreciate y'all's support in there. Only conservative in the race. 
And the only one that's run a positive campaign. Hi. I don't know how many more lies you can tell before you get past him, but... <laughs> Patrick Rose. Hey. Have a nice evening. Hi there. <laughs> the dog's barking at him, not at me, so that that's might right. be a good sign. <laughs> Rick Green, I'd sure appreciate your vote in there for state representative. This is Patrick Rose, a guy that's been lying about me for a year Hi. and a half. I'm a Democrat in the race. Hope you'll look past all his bull. You know, one under criminal investigation, I'm not. What's your name, sir? Bart Swope. Good to meet you, Mr. Swope. Hi, Bart. Rick Green. I'm the guy he's trying to take out. Oh, OK. I appreciate your support in there. Between the two of you, huh? An interesting way for this thing to end. Seven minutes. <sighs> He's the last man standing in the fight. Oh, have you seen Miss Molly? Her cheeks are rosy red. Her lips are soft as satin and they taste like gingerbread. Whoa, 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 me, oh my Miss Molly, I'm in love with you. Why is Texas politics so weird? I can't account for it. There's too much lithium in the water in El Paso. There's too much ozone in the air in the panhandle. Maybe there's a physical cause for this. Uh, but I suspect it's simply cultural. I uh, agree with an old state senator who always said that if you took all the fools out of the legislature, it would not be a representative body anymore. I remember very distinctly standing in the hall, watching him give the speech and watching the reaction to it, and all around were people with tears in their eyes. And I, I, I realized at that moment that his life would never be the same. It is that fundamental belief I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper that makes this country work. Backstage, his wife Michelle offered her advice. Michelle, she didn't want him to go out there and come across as too arrogant. She gave this little don't screw it up buddy <laughs> line to him, which probably calmed his nerves a little bit. I say to them tonight, there is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. I knew much of it was rhetorical. And when he said there's no white America, there's no black America, I kind of winced a little bit. Be, because I know that there is certainly a, a, a black America. But, but I understood where he was coming from. Hope. Hope in the face of difficulty. Hope in the face of uncertainty. The audacity of hope. Going to the convention center. We're on our way to the Zulu Ball. We're on our way to a wonderful time to dance with Maze and, and Frankie Beverly and the OJ. <laughs> and guess what? I don't have a man tonight, but I will have one when I leave. <laughs> <laughs> From the zoo. Everybody grow. a racial New Orleans. That's the only way in which you will acknowledge, accept, respect, appreciate, and enjoy the differences in the culture. There are differences in culture divided by race here and ethnicity. So I don't want a post-racial New Orleans, ever. Um, you know, then we'll be, I'd hate to say Minneapolis. Thank you.
Okay, am I finished, Paul? We're going to walk up with a car, mic you, and then we're going to take Now, wait a minute. This fellow just passed me a card that says, wait a minute, where will you be for eternity? So do you think I need to read this? Because maybe he knows. Well, you, you have all attorney to read it. I have a feeling. I have a feeling I'm not going to be where he would like me. <laughs> What a great body of work. I, I just, uh, I could not be more delighted to uh, have the archive of this guy and, and documenting his, uh, his career. Paul, fantastic stuff. It really is. Uh, you know, there were a few names I forgot. Megan Fields over there, who uh, was one of the producers on the, uh, the Ann Richards and Molly Ivins piece. Horace Newcomb was over there when I first got to the department and helped hire me. Oh, I didn't see Horace Newcomb over there. <laughs> and I've got my colleagues over there, Caroline Frick and Lisa Heron and Kathy Fuller. Uh, and like I said, this is uh, the greatest department there is to work with. And my dean, Jay Bernhardt. So. Well, I mean, I think the way I want to start this off, I asked Paul how he got into this business to begin with, because he started out in, uh, I guess you maybe wanted to be a political science professor or well, I was a, I was a, I was teaching well you are in fact but I mean no, no I was teaching southern politics over at Tulane and I ruined a pretty a, a very good academic career um, <laughs> I, I think I, got, I was pretty bored teaching political science pretty quickly I mean I, I liked I liked the analysis I did pretty high level math and uh, I, you know, statistical analysis on voter participation I liked solving this stuff I just didn't like writing the articles um, and uh, I just it's New Orleans you know I was there and you know I don't know how many people here have ever lived in New Orleans, but um, it's, a, it's a pretty loose place. <laughs> yeah, and, that's uh, an understatement. You know, so, I mean, I you know, got into political consulting. You know, uh, you know Jeff was uh, the, my big campaign. I'm, I don't know, I was playing in a lot of bands. I was, uh, you know, I bumped into somebody who introduced me to somebody, and I made up the idea that I was going to be a filmmaker. I literally made it up, Don. And, uh, and uh, they said, well, sure. You know, it was over at the PBS station, over there, WYS. And they said, well, you can raise some money. We'll make a film. You know, what can academics do? They can write grants. And uh, so I wrote a grant, and I got a little bit of money. And we went over to Mississippi. And um, um, I was doing research, and I was trying to finish my dissertation at the same, same time, living in the Vicksburg uh, YMCA, $2 a night and worth every penny <laughs> in the summertime. Uh, and um, I called up my friend Bob Clark, who was the first African-American elected uh, a state representative in the rural South since Reconstruction. I said, Bob, what should I do? And Bob goes, well, you know, it's funny you had called, Paul, because I'm going to run for Congress. You should film me. And I said, done. Ah, and we okay. raised a little bit of money, and we filmed him for about a week, and we <laughs> edited it. And um, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. It was just great. It's, uh, you know, that very first clip that had the glitch in it, that's H. Rap Brown's brother, Ed Brown, for all you guys old enough to remember who H. Rap Brown was. I'm sitting around in a, in a truck driving around Mississippi. Ed's running uh, Clark's campaign. I'm in my 20s. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm surrounded by guys that I actually know who are friends of mine, you know, who are I'm dragged along the line. My friend Jim Gilmore was at NYU Film School. Artist Mevin was a young African-American cinematographer from Chicago. And it just, it was just, it was, it was I don't know, it's it like water skiing for the first time or something or other. It just, it was just great. And, and so the uh, guy driving the, I mean, not yeah, driving, but the guy was, that yeah, was in the it. Guy that, the guy was going, the, the motivating people, I mean, think about this. You're, you're sitting over there. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. And he goes, getting people to vote is like bringing people from one century to the next century. And he's pointing out the car to that, that courthouse. I mean, I almost drove off the road. I was so excited. Wow. And it just, it was, in every one of these films, I mean, the reason I picked these clips is they all have, you know, things that I look at in uh, that sequence of, of Martin King, you know, the mountaintop speech. Everybody thinks they've seen the mountaintop speech the last 30 seconds of it. I took a year and a half with my friend John Grabowski, who's now retired from N N NBC uh, archivist, 
and we found seven and a half minutes of a 30-minute speech. And it's an amazing speech if you've ever heard the entire speech. And we found, you know, every frame that's, that's there. And in the rough cut screening, you know, we had like an hour and a half film. We decided to show all seven and a half minutes. You know, we, we couldn't put that on TV. And people said, cut this, cut this, cut this. Not a single person said, cut a frame of the seven and a half minutes. And we ended up cutting it down. You know, I'd never heard that story from Coretta King when she told us that she had been on the phone with her husband the night before, and I'll call you the next night. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask you something about, the, about King. Uh, mm -hmm. I, we've done some work that involves mm -hmm. the King estate. And, right. And the problems that, that uh, sure. the King estate. Did you have any problems showing? Uh, you know, I think um, the problem is, is with the copyright, with, uh, with Dr. King's speeches, and we kind of got there right before that happened. Okay. And remember that Mrs. King was still alive. I think when she passed away, right. uh, that, was, that was the problem. The kids you know, decided that they had copyright, and quite frankly, they really don't, but no one's willing to sue them. So, it's, um, so we well, were lucky. I mean, in the opinion of many, many people, Eyes on the Prize is probably the uh, best documentary ever made on uh, the civil rights movement. Well, it was my film school. That's I mean, I'd made two films without knowing what I was doing, and everybody on that thing was we're, we're experienced filmmakers uh, and Henry Hampton the late Henry Hampton was the executive producer you know pulled me out of I don't want to go into details but I, my film career was not exactly ratcheting up in New Orleans and I lost my job at Tulane and all of a sudden he offers me a job to come to Boston and pay me a lot of money for what I was used to and all of a sudden I'm working with like real cinematographers and sound people and editors and uh, it was it was an amazing experience so that was a whole new level then. oh yeah, yeah. gosh yeah uh, and among brothers, mm -hmm. going back to New Orleans right. again, and we were just talking about Bill Jefferson earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, t tell us a little bit about your relationship with Bill Jefferson, who is, as you said earlier, was in federal prison now in Beaumont. Well, as Texas. Governor Richardson knows, he was a very smart guy, and I was very attracted to him. You know, we'd both gone to Harvard. I felt, you know, that, you know, uh, that I had a kinship with him of a sorts. Um, and it was it was a interesting deal because I was doing his polling and his strategy. I was also on TV analyzing the election, and I was also making a film about the election. So this is New Orleans. There's no, no concept of, of conflict of interest. And it was a complete revelation to me when I showed up uh, to cover his opponent, Sidney Bartholomew, uh, who was a light-skinned Creole city councilman. And Sidney took one look at me with a, a camera and started screaming at me, going, you know, you're spying on me. And I go, oh, oh yeah, I guess I'm working for the other guy. So this is New Orleans, and I thought about this for a while. My friend Eddie Kurtz, who was kind of a documentary filmmaker and was a friend of the Bartholomew family, I said, Eddie, why don't you take my crew out there and just film him? And Sidney never knew the difference. And so in all the shots following Bartholomew around town, my friend Eddie is kind of like stiffly walking next to Bartholomew. It's kind of like, what is this white dude, dude going over here? But we, you know, uh, we got all the stuff that we needed. It's, um, and at, like, like I said, I was on camera almost every night on television. I made a deal with the TV station. They had just come out with the Sony Betacams. It was sort of like the next step up of cameras. And they had a loaner, and I said I wanted to borrow it for a couple of days because I was doing analysis, and we borrowed it for two months. <laughs> I thought it was OK because so, he kept repairing it. Yeah. Okay. So that's how we were able to make the well, film. Well, you know, talking about outrageous characters, I mean, of course, Edwin Edwards. That, mm -hmm. that was just amazing Isn't stuff. that a wonderful quote? Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we did it. We did it. We were there with him for like 20 minutes. He was he was going to lose that election to Buddy Romer, and it, it was a terrible campaign. And we're trying to get him to uh, to say something interesting. And actually, uh, I got a number of people from my class. I was actually going to show you guys what led up to this. It's about four minutes of nonsense. You know, asking him who's the greatest politician you ever saw, Huey Long, Lyndon Johnson. You know, and finally he gets it that we want him to talk about himself. Okay, and then you hear, and then I go in for the kill, and I go, who's the greatest politician you ever saw in your lifetime? He looks at me and goes, every time I shave and look in the mirror. That's all we use. That's great. <laughs> well, some a great man. Well, from the ridiculous to, to the sublime, uh, the, the, the film that you made on uh, Little Bighorn, mm -hmm. uh, that's a riveting scene there mm -hmm. where he is singing his uh, grandfather's death song. Joe Medicine Crow is still alive. He's 100 years old. Is that right? Yeah. He won a silver star in World War II for counting coup on German soldiers and stealing horses. Uh, he was one of the first Native Americans to get uh, an advanced degree in anthropology. He's an amazing guy. He told hilarious stories about being in Los Angeles in the 1930s. He said he tried to get work on a Hollywood uh, film that wanted, Native, wanted Indians. And he said he couldn't get any work because his nose wasn't big enough and all the Indians were all Jews and Italians. <laughs> 
But um, he kept wanting me to sing the song, you know, and I wasn't quite sure how it fit in. I didn't realize it was his grandfather's death song. His grandfather was one of the scouts who was smart enough to get the hell out of there before they all died. Right, right. He lived to tell the story. Yeah, so Joe of followed us out onto the battlefield. It was thundering, and he says, can I sing the song? So he put up a, you know, Apple box on there, and he sings the song with the thunder in the background. And it's oh, kind of, I guess one of those revelations. Did, did that you was rig even, that? You had to rig no, that. No, 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 no. It's real thunder. I'm kidding. That we we might have made it a little bit louder. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was a great scene. That was a really great mm -hmm. scene. And now, now switching back to the maybe the ridiculous, and that's OU football. Mm -hmm. now, no, uh, you, this film you did vote for me, which uh, mm -hmm. you were up in Norman, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and featured Mike Turpin. Mm -hmm. The former attorney general. Sonar. Yeah, tell us a little bit about Mike Turpin. I don't know anything about Um, You know, we the, the, the vote for me was a film that took us a year and a half, two years. Uh, we had three editors working. We filmed in 30 states. We kept running out of money, um, and just whenever we were about to run out of money, the Ford Foundation or MacArthur Foundation would show up. And, um, and Turpin, I went over to Oklahoma mostly to hang out with um, uh, J.C. Watts, the African-American mm, congressman, yeah. uh, who was really boring. I had a really weird time with him. I went to a bunch of churches. And he'd and been a quarterback. At he was a quarterback at OU. OU, yeah. And he's only in the films in one of those things going, I'm J.C. Watts running for, uh, for Congress. And, but I just felt there must be something there, and I had about three or four hours left when, when I was doing a research trip in Norman, and I'm looking at my notes, and it says Mike Turpin, former attorney general, had five stars, maybe six stars, and I call him up, and he's hysterical on the phone, and I go, well, can we meet, and we met, it's OU, so we met at a football bar, you know, a sports bar with a big football on top of it, and Mike told every story he shows in the film to me as if it was the first time, and I knew this guy was good because he had his two-year-old and he wasn't looking at the two-year-old. Two-year-old was sitting next to him. Every time the two-year-old began to tip over, Mike would just go like this and catch him without, without missing anything in what he was saying. So the trick was, where do I put this guy? And, and he says, we, we thought about it, and he says, well, why don't you go to the tailgating thing, because everybody running for office is going to be there. And the entire sequence is just hysterical. By the way, he did tell me that Attorney General in Oklahoma, the AG office, stands for aspiring governor. <laughs> aspiring governor. <laughs> he was a Democrat? Yeah. Mr. But yeah, he was. It looked like he was promoting Republicans there. No, or was no, he no. just he was just joking? Well, he was. He was that. friends with everybody. There's yeah, actually, well, I could tell that. Yeah. He actually puts his arm around the guy that actually won for governor and goes, "This guy's not going to win. You know, the real guy is going to win over there." And we put underneath, you know, this guy's now governor. Yeah. Well, you know, the other, of course, very seriously, because I, I, I'm a big fan mm -hmm. of your documentary about George Wallace, mm -hmm. setting the woods on fire. It's a fabulous. All of your work's fabulous, but. Uh, it's a particular subject that I'm very mm -hmm. interested in anyway. And to see that scene, actually that video of uh, Wallace uh, puffing on that cigar, uh, how did you do that? Well, Wallace um, um, was living alone in, in his house in Montgomery. He'd been paralyzed for 20 years. And he literally used to watch videotapes of himself. Um, you know, it, it was like, it was, it was, it was weird. And uh, the first time I went over to see him, the state police said, well, you go through this door and you'll see him. And I opened up the door, it's his bedroom. So I um, remember all these films are collaborations. You know, every single thing over here is why I put those credits up there. And it's not just me. It's, right. it's I'm working with right. Dan McCabe, who was the best editor I've ever worked with for music. You know, and Dan and I were co-producing. And Dan said, why don't we uh, film him, but let's drape the entire room in black and just film him. And so we, his last film I think I did in film. And so we draped it all in black. We lit it you know, the way, you know, very dramatically. And we just filmed him for an hour and a half. And, because uh, he couldn't really speak, so he's smoking the cigar, he's falling asleep, he's looking up, you know, the smoke goes up with the cigar. And at the very end of the film, um, where people are talking about, you know, you know, did he really repent, did he not repent? Right, You right. know, and they're disagreeing, and all of a sudden he looks right into the camera. It's like you're looking into his soul. It just it was an hour and a half of amazing material, and it just looks beautiful, and it, it was Dan's idea. So. It's, an, it's an incredible documentary. Uh, tell us about Karen, the amazing Grace singer. Oh, uh, Maggie. Maggie Lauder. Um, uh, it's Ma the, okay, Maggie. Okay. It's, it's the last hour and a half of Vote for Me, and actually uh, it's probably closest to the way I look at politics, that film. Um, um, uh, Charlie Cook, who does the Cook Political Report for any of those political junkies out there, is an old buddy of mine from Shreveport, Louisiana. And um, I, I went over, it was like a hot summer night in DuPont Circle, and... Uh, a lot of activity going on for those of you that have been in DuPont Circle on a June night. And uh, Charlie and I are just talking, and I go, I, I need to find somebody who's charismatic in a swing district who might be able to win, who doesn't know anything at all about politics. 
I want, I want somebody who's a tabula rasa, somebody that you can identify with. Because at the end of two and a half hours of vote for me, you know, it's all about how do you win? What are candidates yeah. like? You know, Willie Brown, you know, talking about, uh, uh, you know, what, you know, politicians, you know, you know, with a dipshit line. By the way, I don't know if you noticed, there was a bust of Willie Brown. He was mayor of San Francisco over his shoulder. We put it there, okay? And he walks into his office, takes one look at the bust and goes, yeah. He goes, sure. <laughs> the only man I know that has a bust of himself, uh, the only other person is Pat Buchanan, uh, who had his bust in his foyer of his house. And uh -huh. we didn't move it there for the Wallace deal. But um, so Charlie goes, Maggie Lauder. She came into the office the other day. She's beautiful. She's talented. She's charismatic and has no idea what she's doing. And so I went down to North, uh, North Carolina. And, yeah, uh, I was going to ask where this was. I did, yeah, it's Western North Carolina. It's okay. Asheville. It's a very yeah. nice place to film. And... Uh, <clears throat> And so I go off, you know, just, just to monitor her with Greer Weeks, her campaign manager, and uh, she's terrible. She's at an old age home. She's just not a very good speaker. And all of a sudden, she breaks out a dulcimer. And I'm going, what's, what's going on here? And she starts singing Amazing Grace. And I look over at Greer, and he goes. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, I don't know. I, I, we sent her our films. I was, I was working with my buddies, Louis Alvarez and Andy Colker, that I made the Louisiana film with, Vote For Me. Getting back to abnormal, and we literally were just in Colorado filming the last couple of days on a new project, and um, we just got all this access, and we really weren't willing, we really weren't planning to film her, but it was so good, and the access was so good, we just kept going back and back and back. And it's the last hour and a half of the film, and then the reason I think it's the closest, uh, I, I remember we were trying to finish the film, and Andy was the lead guy in the editing room because Louie and I had filmed it, and uh, one day Andy and I walked back from our editing room in Manhattan all the way back to Brooklyn over the Brooklyn Bridge. And he said, I, I want you to talk to me about what it's like to be in a campaign, what it's like to win, what it's like to lose. Just listening to me. And that night he wrote the narration. And it's, it's, it's very good. <laughs> well, did she win? She didn't well, I don't, I don't want you to know. You've got to watch the film. Oh. <laughs> touché, touché, touché. Um, Molly Ivins, mm -hmm. uh, you made that video about Molly, I think. Like, After she passed away. That started to so, say, yeah. yeah. Uh, what was the circumstances surrounding that You know, uh, um, you know, uh, and I think uh, Ellen Sweets back there knows this, that, uh, you know, I kept waiting for Molly to get better. Um, and uh, I think, Ellen, you remember you, uh, you, you and Molly and I went out to dinner after her first remission uh, to that Thai restaurant. And... Uh, you know, and I wanted to do something, but I wanted, you know, when she got better, and she never, never got better, better. And after she passed away, I felt really guilty about it, and um, I knew I had some material. And uh, uh, Sandra Guardado just did an amazing job of editing it all together. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's really quite beautiful. It's only five minutes long. It's the same thing that happened after Anne died, yeah. you know, where I pulled together just the stuff that we had filmed of her, including that last thing you saw where she's talking about eternity. I'd never even seen that. It was at the very end of the raw tape, and you yeah, know, that was a throat clincher, I have to well, say. Well, yeah, it's kind of like I, you know, it, it's it's I, I'd never even looked at it until afterwards, and I'm going, I yeah. can't believe this is here. Yeah. So, so that that was it. It was just putting together well, something. Well, to a more happy on a ha more happier note, mm -hmm. uh, New Orleans getting back to abnormal, which is a great uh, title, by the way, and that it's last. Not a bad standing line. Pardon me. It's not a bad uh, last standing line. The Minneapolis line. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's that was great, but also. Uh, uh, you know when she, when the, the woman oh, when Barbara was, comes down and yeah says coming that, down is yeah by the way those are two transvestites in gowns that were in back of her <laughs> she says she, she she calls me up and she goes I really want you guys to film us on the way to the ball uh -huh. and she's sitting there and going my friends are coming their friends are coming and we look off and it's like one of those foggy nights in January and I see these two figures these large figures moving through the fog in gowns and I'm going these are very big women <laughs> <laughs> so she got a big kick out of that. Uh, do you have a current pro project, or are you yeah. working on something? Um, uh, we've got a project called Postcards from the Great Divide. It's going to be uh, 10 films, 10 short films shot around the United States about 10 different aspects of American politics that relate to uh, the 2016 election. And theoretically, um, um, they'll be on the news hour one a week starting in June and then on the front page of the New York Times op doc section. Uh, and we're trying to figure this out. We were just out in Colorado trying to do the pilot about um, a recall election for school board that a million dollars is getting spent on as an example of uh, the nationalization or this functionalization of local politics. Yeah. And um, 
It was kind of an issue. We got to rethink this. I'll probably go back for four or five days at the end of the month. But you're shooting for what kind of timing? What's uh, the timing on this? Uh, we'll, they'll be done next May, June. Oh, okay. So. Okay, great. Uh, I think we've got some folks probably out here who might want to ask you a question or two. And we've got, I don't know how we've got this set up, guys. Or do we have a, is this microphone live down here? Ben, or you can uh, go find whoever has a question. I saw the first hand. I thought way I back saw a hand there. back there somewhere. And the, right in the back by the camera. Yeah. So we can all hear. If, if you'll wait just one second, we're gonna we're gonna we'll get you, we'll let you broadcast the question. Paul, do you anticipate doing a documentary on the Tea Party takeover of the state legislature? If so, why so? If not, why not? Um, I think um, we're going to do Texas, Ellen, but I, I'm much more interested in, because um, the Tea Party is going to be a big part of the Colorado film. Um, and these are just different aspects. So Florida will be about African-American turnout. Uh, North Carolina will be, how come there are no more white Democrats in the South? Um, and Texas is going to be about Latino turnout. I just had dinner with uh, Pete Gallego down over in San Antonio to start this. And, you know, it's about Latino turnout and, you know, when that vote turns out, is it going to be as democratic as people think it is? Because I don't think it's going to be. I think it'll be closer to 60, 40 than it'd be 75, 25. But um, that's, that's the, the idea right now. And I'm working with uh, a friend of mine here to be able to figure that out. But right now, we're, we're not committing to anything in terms of the states until Andy, Louie, and I figure out how to do Colorado to see what the model is, see how much the budgets will actually cost to be able to do this. So, We'll probably be more set in the, the different states probably in a month or two. Another question? Right over here, Ben. Right. Paul, thanks for all your great work. Um, a question that so much is in the South. Mm -hmm. You went to Harvard. There's a lot of color, too, up in, in some of the Bronx and... Yeah, Boston and some of those areas. What kind of kept you here as opposed to exploring more in other parts of the country? Well, like I, I did my dissertation on, on black politics in the South. And it was mostly, um, you know, when I went to Harvard, uh, for some reason, all the Americanists all quit. You know, Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, um, I would called her up and I was going to work with her and she left. You know, and a couple of the other guys went on leave for a year and there was nothing to do. And... Um, uh, I've been in a band with a bunch of Southerners, so I spent a lot of time over in Florida, uh, if you count Northern Florida as the South, which, which I did. Um, and um, I don't know, uh, uh, there was a course over at the JFK School, the Institute of Politics and Southern Politics. I have no idea why I sat in on it. And it was uh, taught by this uh, used car dealer that had run as a liberal Republican for governor. And he brought Bob Clark in. I just liked those guys. And uh, I saw a sort of an in, and then... Um, Doug Price, who's since passed away, he was a student of uh, V.O. Key, who wrote the, uh, the uh, classic book, uh, Southern Politics. And I were talking one day, and he said, you know, I think I can give you 500 bucks to go down south. You want to do some research? And I said, sure, I'll go to Mississippi. I had no idea why I said Mississippi. So I bought a plane ticket. I bought a seersucker suit and a straw hat. <laughs> so I fit in, Horace. Fit right in. And, <laughs> and I flew to Jackson. I rented a car. I drove around for a month. Uh, and I wrote, a, I think, a 100-page paper that Sam Beer, who was the president of the American Political Science Association, misinterpreted and quoted me. I thought it was great. He was quoting me for the wrong reason. But I was, yeah, I was, I was famous among graduate students. I was a foot, footnote number six. And uh, so I said, well, this is, this, is, this is good. I'll become an expert in Southern politics. And then uh, much to my mis uh, uh, confusion, when I went to get a job, the only people that wanted to hire me were universities in the South. And I was just lucky I picked uh, New Orleans. Because I don't know what I would have done if I had been over well, in Starkville, was, Mississippi. Or that was certainly fertile ground. Yeah. For another question? Yeah, right over here. The film about uh, Little Bighorn seems to be apart from the other films yeah. about more recent po uh, mm -hmm. politics. How did that come about? Um, I was broke. And uh, or I didn't have a film project. Uh, Louisiana Boys we made for about $20,000. We were editing on a VHS editing system in my kitchen. And I, I needed a gig. And um, I was literally in a used bookstore 
and uh, I saw Evan Cannell's uh, book, uh, Son of the Morning Star, which I'd read years beforehand. I go, that's a good film. Um, and so I pitched it to the American Experience, and much to my amazement, they said yes. Um, the best part about that was that, um, I don't know how many people here have ever read uh, any of James Welch's novels, uh, Native American novelist from Montana. And um, uh, he wrote one of my favorite books uh, um, uh, years before that. And uh, uh, a friend of mine was a veterinarian in Missoula and was in a poetry group with him and uh, said, he's a really good guy. You should call him up. Because I, I wanted to do this as a sort of a, a cross-cultural Native American point of view, white point of view. And I called him up. And amazingly enough, he talked to me. And we ended up uh, working together on it. So it was just, um, you know, it was history. Um, and it was different. And um, um, I spent uh, three months driving around from reservation to reservation with my associate producer and with Jim. And we had a lot of really crazy adventures. Um, but and actually, they're not in the film, but they're in the book that Jim wrote called Killing Custer. Uh, mm. And uh, just it was an amazing project. Yeah, but it was something totally different. But it was a lot of fun. Another question? We've got time for a couple more. David? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to thank you for taking our time. We've got a microphone for you, David. Thank you for joining the Briscoe Center. The, I love your stuff. Uh, I, too, have spent a lifetime doing politics still photography, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I just loved, loved your work. I'm really interested in, in how you're thinking about um, uh, social media. Uh, you know, you see all of these video clips now, mm -hmm. uh, and, and how that kind of thing would fold in to what you're doing or other projects. You there, know, there, there, was a, there was a real funny one a day or two ago that Rand Paul did, Mm -hmm. and, it, and it was um, uh, something about, uh, yeah, I'm Rand Paul, and yes, I'm still running for president. Uh, it, it, was, it was a real funny thing, but yeah. it was shot in a motel parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, I, I'm, you know, I'm pretty old school in my own films. Um, I'm not quite sure that there's a big audience out there for a three-hour film about George Wallace anymore. Um, uh, sadly. And you know, uh, the, the, the whole idea of this new series about making little six to ten minute films is to take advantage of that. But I, I you know, I don't think I'm ever really going to be, you know, organically part of social media. So it's probably time for me to, to ta pass the baton <laughs> and let people who know how to do this. I mean, I know what I know how to do. And it's kind of, it's, uh, you know, and I think it can work in a short form, but I'm not sure that it, I'm not quite sure how to do the other stuff. So I probably will never learn which is okay with me. We've got time for one more question. I saw a handout in this direction. Okay, good, yeah. We, we've been ignoring this side of the room here. Yeah. When did you guys come in? All y'all over there, we didn't see that. I really enjoy uh, your production and your sense of humor. Um, I, I do not want to endanger your life, but I was wondering if you will <laughs> You will, um, Is there an exit you will consider yeah. um, the gun control issue. And if you could put a, a humorous spin on it. I like, I like the idea of a humorous spin on it. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, um, I guess I've been very, very lucky. I've been able to do every film that I wanted to do, except for maybe the Jerry Springer for governor film. But you know, he, he copped out of me and didn't run for governor. Um, it's just not one of those topics that um, that interests me that much because it's. I'd have to figure out what the story is. You know, these things only work because there's good characters and you have access to something. And um, the gun debate is is. It's an important debate, but the debate itself is kind of non-existent in a lot of ways. A lot of people screaming at each other, um, and I. I, I, I'm not, not quite, it's not for me. It's kind of like it's for somebody else. Uh, it's not my kind of film. I, I, I don't do films specifically about issues. I do films about topics that I'm interested in. And, um, you know, like I said, I think I have an understanding of American politics that, um, you know, didn't serve me very well as a political consultant. You know, I was good at that, but I wasn't very good at convincing candidates to listen to me. Um, and I'm better at this, and it's kind of like stuff that I feel comfortable with, if that makes any sense. Well, anything else? Okay, well, thank you for being here tonight, and again, thank Paul Specker.
Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.